Good evening, everyone. So as our, as our speakers make their way up, um, I'm going to say hello and good evening. Bonsoir. Buenas tardes a todos y todos. Um, you know, we're up here high in the sky above Toronto, and it's important that we acknowledge the original peoples that were here and acknowledge that we're on the, um, the one bowl, uh, sorry, the dish and one spoon uh, territory, which is the result of a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas, and the, the Haudenosaunee. And it's become a common practice to recognize the land that we're on in Canada, and it's an important practice for us to have because it reminds us of those who stewarded this land before we came, it also reminds us of the important colonial histories that define the presence that we, the present day that we know today. But it also is an important reminder of the long journey ahead in our individual roles in supporting reconciliation in this country. My name is Nicholas Moyer. I'm the CEO of CUSO International. It's a role that I hold in great honor and have uh, for a short year and a half uh, so far. Um, we're a 60 year old organization that works in international development and cooperation. Um, we support the world's, uh, we support communities that are marginalized. And we do that in 16 countries. We do that in Latin America and the Caribbean. We do that in Africa. We do that in Northern Canada. And we're an organization that focuses really on three uh, main themes. We focus and primarily and first and foremost on gender equality and social inclusion. We also work on economic opportunities and uh, livelihoods. And finally, we are really committed to advancing in the fight against climate change and its tremendous impacts around the world. You know, every day and in everything that we do at QSO International, we focus on um, those that have been excluded from the mainstream. And whatever reason that may be, may, be it social, be it racial reasons, be it polit politics, be it e economics. And um, marginalization comes in many different forms. Um, in different places in the world, but some things are pretty consistent. We find that women and girls are consistently excluded from the mainstream. We find that LGBTQ communities are excluded or the extreme poor. Um, and there are many forms of marginalization. Among those that are marginalized are migrants and refugees. And increasingly for us at CUSO over the last few decades, we have found ourselves working closely with migrants and refugees in the countries where we, where we operate. And it's the subject of our panel tonight. It's a subject that matters a great deal to us and to you that have come tonight. And so um, we're gonna be entering a great conversation as we examine the implications of a really expanding global refugee and migration crisis. One that seems to every year break new bounds and records. But even if, as we talk of statistics, we can't forget how these are individuals whose families and lives have been torn asunder as they find uh, they need to search for security elsewhere. And of course, as we think about the individuals that are affected by these big changes, we also have to think about the host communities and host nations that are receiving them and the implications on them. Now, there are no single solutions to these global challenges or reversing these trends today, um, but there are people who are really working hard to try to find some of those solutions. And whether those be at an individual level, at a community or a national or international level, and we're gonna hear a lot about that today. I want to take a, just a moment before we start to thank our, our partners uh, today, the, the World Refugee and Migration Council, who does great work, le work leading global reflections on how we can find solutions to the global migration and refugee crisis, and who have been great partners of us tonight, and that have been working a lot on looking at um, issues in the Western Hemisphere, and I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about that this evening. I want to thank Lloyd Axworthy in particular, Chair of the World Refugee and Migration Council, for being here with us tonight. I also want to thank our alumni and donors and board members who are here tonight. Uh, thank you for your support. Without you, none of what we do is possible. And so thank you so much for being here and, of course, to those who made this evening possible. And to all of you for taking time out to join us this evening. Hope you enjoy and learn together uh, a great deal. Um, and without any further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our um, our moderator for tonight and this evening, our, our guide through the conversation, Nala Ayed, um, is known to many as a foreign correspondent with CBC and now is the host of CBC Ideas. Uh, Nala, thank you for taking, um, having such curiosity for the big topics of the world and helping us walk through those and for giving us a bit of your time this evening as we enter and explore this conversation together. So thank you, Nala, and over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> 
Thank you so much, Nick, for those lovely comments. And thank you to all of you for being here tonight. It is um, a real honor to be involved in this conversation. It's a conversation that's incredibly important, as I don't need to tell all of you. So we will get right into it by introducing our panel first, if that's good with you. But I wanted to just confirm, do we have the connection with Bogota? Yeah, we do. All right. I'll just begin maybe to introduce the panel who are here. Some of them I haven't yet met yet, but we'll start at the end there with Amrik Astra, who is the country representative in Colombia for CUSO International. Amrik has been on the front lines of the Venezuelan crisis since its beginning in 2018, responding to the needs of Venezuelan migrants, IDPs, and host communities through socioeconomic integration initiatives, promoting the generation of inclusive economic opportunities for this population. Tanya Shepard is head of programs, Latin America and the Caribbean, CUSO International. She's worked on the international development sector for the past 20 years with specific focus on community-based development, women's rights and participation, and economic empowerment of marginalized groups in Latin America and the Caribbean. And of course, the man who don't, doesn't need any introduction, Honorable, uh, the Honorable Lloyd Axworthy, the chair of the World Refugee and Migration Council and former Canadian Minister of Foreign Affairs and Migration. Uh, as you know, he's one of Canada's leading voices on global migration and refugee protection and spent 27 years uh, as a politician. Yeah. And <laughs> moving back to Ottawa here. Uh, Alec Oviedo, I believe, is with us. Can someone confirm? Alec, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you guys clearly. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank Alec, you. Alec uh, Oviedo is a Venezuelan migrant who is currently working with a digital technology company that is a partner of CUSO's uh, SCOPE program in Colombia. Uh, he's joining us from Bogota. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being Thank here. Thank you guys. Amrak, I want to start with you, if that's okay. Yeah. I myself found my knowledge wanting about the situation with Venezuelan migration and just how big the crisis is as we stand in this moment. Can you paint a picture of what it is like right now? Uh, the movement. Yeah, well, please. Thank you very much, and Nala, and I think it's working. Ah, yeah. there we go. Yeah. So thank you very much, and I'm really happy to be here. As I was uh, introduced, I'm working in, in Colombia in front of what is uh, described as the fourth largest uh, migrant crisis in the world. If uh, we agree to the figures, um, nowadays it is, uh, after Syria, Afghanistan, and Ukraine, uh, the biggest migrant crisis uh, that the world is facing. And I've been working in, in, uh, in that crisis since 2018. But first, just before I contextualize, I, I just would like to, to tell you an anecdote about the world crisis, because world matters, and we are speaking about migration crisis. And I think nowadays when one is looking at uh, the news or the television or the radio, um, the world crisis is something that we hear everywhere. The Ukrainian crisis, the inflation crisis, uh, the unemployment crisis, and so on. But the world matters. And, and in many cases, when we speak about crisis, we think about something that is momentary, which means there is a beginning and there is an end um, to the crisis. And, and I remember just before joining CUSO, I was working for a humanitarian organization in a different life. And um, that was an organization that was bringing relief uh, to people affected by climate crisis, humanitarian crisis all over the world. I was in Colombia. And um, Cartagena, which is a lovely city in Colombia, was hit by a hurricane. And as uh, the leader of that organization, we are trying to set up a mission in the city. And we're speaking with local government and have that lady on the phone saying, how can we help with the crisis? And I feel a blank in the conversation. And, and after that, she replied to me, but what crisis are you speaking about? And mm -hmm. we're in the middle of the COVID pandemic. Cartagena is one of the city that tourists will see as a really beautiful city, but there is highly unequal. Uh, 70 or 80% of the population is living um, below the poverty line. It's a city that is receiving a lot of migrants. Um, so basically she was telling me, well, look, if you're here for the hurricane and the crisis, like, uh, thank you very much, but like, we don't need your help. Yeah. What we need is solutions to this crisis. It's a long-term solution to end the crisis. And I think when we speak about migration crisis, in Latin America, and specifically about the Venezuelan crisis, 
we are in a situation where we don't have an end uh, to the situation. There is currently seven million, more than seven million Venezuelans mm -hmm. that fled their countries to other countries um, such as Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. And could um, you speak just uh, briefly about, I know you can't speak about such a large group of people and make generalities, but could you compare the level of distress that these migrants are experiencing now compared to when you started working in this area in 2018? Well, I, I think like a lot of what we see is that migrants do have strong and high humanitarian and protection needs. And when you are a migrant and, and go through these um, uh, processes on migration routes, the first thing you need is education, is health, is access to the basic social services and so on. And this is something, something valid and something that we've seen um, with people coming in Colombia since the beginning of the crisis in 2018, since now, up until nowadays. Um, but also what we've seen is that these people are here to stay. Um, yeah. Canada is a, st is a country of migration and um, I think like a good example of how integration can, can really put um, end to the process, to the migration processes. I think what, what we are seeing in, in, in these countries such as Colombia, Ecuador and Peru is um, that th these are countries that never received migrants before. Mm -hmm. And this is something very new for, for Colombia uh, as such and for other countries. And there is no, um, there is no way that um, migrants are gonna return to, to Venezuela very soon. Okay. So what we've seen in terms of needs and in terms of humanitarian needs of this population is that we now pass the crisis sort of level. There are still a lot of people going out of Venezuela and so on. Mm -hmm. But what we need to put an end to the crisis is that receiving countries such as Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, Chile, and other um, actually do provide long-term solutions so we can uh, stop calling it the crisis. So let's go to Colombia and talk about uh, the experience of one particular individual. Alec, you can hear me all right? Yes, I can hear you okay. clearly. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we hear you and see you perfectly. Can you talk a little bit about how it is that you found yourself in Colombia and what life is like for you there now. Can you tell us your, sure. the story of your journey? Absolutely. I'll be more than happy to share my story with you guys. First of all, I want to say thank you for the opportunity that this country has given me. It means a lot to me because when I was really um, the deepest hole of the ocean, this country provided me... Could you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. So this country provide me uh, a place to stay and also provide me a, an opportunity to, to work. I had to come here to Colombia about three years ago due to the, um, um, due to the problem, due to the issue that was going on in Venezuela. I have to leave my family behind. My dad used to be an attorney and he was fighting pretty much against the government and then the prosecution started with my family and I was feeling rescued. So I have to come here and I found this excellent uh, business, which is IGT, is uh, one of the uh, um, partners with Kuzo. They gave me the opportunity to join them and here I am improving and, show, and showing the people and showing the rest of the world that Venezuelan, uh, the Venezuelan people actually has a lot of skills to prove people wrong. Mm -hmm. and, are, are, and your family, what's their situation? Uh, right now, the situation for my family, I could say it is very tough because my dad couldn't work anymore because to every job interview that he was going to, after they like um, researching on their background, they weren't given the opportunity. My mom right now is working as a, as a teacher or a kindergarten. Um, she's doing okay. However, as, it's not a secret for anybody that which their salary is something that is not very good about it. It's not something that you that can sustain a family. So I'm pretty much the one um, helping my family right now. You're sending money back. Yes, I am. I'm sending money right here mm -hmm. in order to, you know, to have them comfortable and at least have uh, all they need. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, Tanya, uh, Alec, of course, is, is one example of, of many who are 
taking part in this program and SCOPE. I wonder if you could tell us what SCOPE stands for and what it, what, what it is that it does. <coughs> Just sure. We have some sense of what it is. Sure. Are you able to hear me? Yes. So SCOPE stands for Sustainable Colombian Opportunities for Peace Building and Employment. It is a project funded by Global Affairs Canada, started in 2015. I'm very happy to say we are entering in our ninth year. Um, and I would say the last four or five years. So traditionally, the project focused on providing training opportunities to women, youth, and victims of the conflict in Colombia to access decent employment and entrepreneurship opportunities. Going back about four years, we were approached by the Canadian government um, around the Venezuelan migrant crisis, recognizing that there was a lot of Venezuelan um, individuals arriving in Colombia, and could we look at including a new group in the project? Of course, we said yes. And so the focus then for the last four years has been specifically on the socioeconomic integration of the Venezuelan migrant population. So looking at individuals who are arriving in country, what we found the most pressing need was after sort of humanitarian assistance is we had a lot of individuals saying, we need jobs, we need jobs very quickly. We need to provide shelter, we have to buy food for our families, we need to send our kids to school. <coughs> so essentially the project partners with private sector companies who have labor vacancies. Mm -hmm. We work with the Venezuelan migrant population as well as host communities who want to offer, extend those opportunities to the host communities, recognizing that within Colombia and Peru and Ecuador, host community members are still dealing with issues of unemployment, with um, you know, informal employment. So we wanted to assure that we extend the same opportunities. And we are proud to say as of December, we linked 10,000 individuals to employment in Colombia. Mm. And we're currently in the process of replicating that model in Ecuador, Peru, recognizing those two countries are just starting to address the Venezuelan migrant population. Uh, in integrating society. So that, in a nutshell, is what um, what's the SCOPE project is. Mm -hmm. I imagine when you think about the scale of this problem, when we're talking about 7 million people, and you've just mentioned mm -hmm. that you, in one year, were able to help 10,000. That's 10,000 more than most yep. people. But it's still a very small number. Yep. How do you feel about those numbers when you recognize the scale of what's going on? Yeah, I think when we reached the 10,000 uh, mark after eight years, it was a really impactful moment. But what I take away from managing this project for the last eight or nine years is the individual story. So a lot of times when I'm traveling to Columbia, we were just there recently with our CEO, Nicholas Moyer. We really want to meet the individuals that we're having an impact with. And some of the stories you hear, I remember we met a woman from Venezuela in Medellin. Um, she was one of our participants, and she had, I believe, eight or nine children. And she told the story. We arrived from Venezuela um, with eight or nine kids. My husband wasn't working. And she was um, staying up very late looking for materials to recycle and sell. Mm -hmm. And it was so impactful because she said, once I joined the SCOPE project, I received training. She now works in a textile factory. She said, I can spend time at home with my family. We can send our kids to school. Those moments for me, doesn't matter if it's 10,000, 5,000, 100. When you hear those stories, you don't really know what to say. In Canada, we are very, very fortunate. We have social service system. We have you know, employment support services. We have you know, accessible education. In some of these countries, if you're a migrant, you don't have those same opportunities. So for me, when I see what we've done, and just if it's one, two, five, 100 people, for me, when you hear those individual stories, it really is why you know, I've been with CUSA for 10 years and continue that work. It's, those are the, the stories that, that really show the difference that we're making. That's a great answer. Lloyd Axworthy, I wonder if I can bring you in here. You've, you and I have talked about the migration crisis, as you say, this amorphous term. We have not talked about specifically what is happening in our own backyard. I wonder, I mean, it's what your organization is seized with. Why has it been so difficult to find common cause on this issue, you know, one by one, helping people yeah. in North America and in Latin America. Why has it been so difficult? I think the problem is that we have a political crisis, a governance crisis, that um, all the details and the stories that we've heard uh, are not unmanageable. They're not inconsolable. 
we'd done it in the past. I mean, when I was an immigration minister in uh, Pierre Trudeau's government, and that just gave away a lot of age, <laughs> uh, there was an opportunity to work with 16 other governments in a collaborative international network in terms of the large numbers of people who were exiting uh, Vietnam and the Indochina Peninsula after the war. And it worked. Uh, in our own case, I, I, I hope you don't mind my being uh, a little historical, but when I took that office, Ron Atke was the uh, Minister of Immigration under <laughs> Joe Clark's government. And I remember he, we sat over lunch and he said to me, he said, you know, this is a job where you have a sacred trust. Mm. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, well, he said, you have to ensure that, uh, that in the politics and governance in Canada is open and receptive and caring about the people who have been displaced. Mm -hmm. Does anyone huh? see it like a sacred trust today? No. That's, I, 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 I'm being very categorical. I, uh, I find, for example, that that group of 16 I talked about, uh, I went down the list. So who were on the frontier, on the, on, right on the cutting edge? the Danish government. Mm. It was just announced last week the Danish government is sending uh, asylum Syrians back to Syria because they say it's safe. Mm. Well, uh, th that's a total, and why? Because all of a sudden they feel the heat from their kind of political opponents. Uh, I'm gonna be very direct here in Canada. Uh, our government just signed or an extended program on the third party, it's a safe agreement, which basically uh, nobody mentioned how this is going to impact mm. those who are coming to Canada. It was all about all these illegals, I'm protecting Canadians, it's going to make sure our borders are okay. But what it meant, there was nobody saying, what does it mean for those? Well, uh, that's not the language that we should be using, that's not the narrative. But there's been a particular challenge in the, in the, in the story of this hemisphere, this part of the yeah. world, where, I mean, in a way, the, the migration, oh, it was a refugee crisis with Syria, yeah. I mean, resonated far more than mm. what I sense the, the reaction is to the crisis in Venezuela. Well, it's mixed. I, I mean, I think, uh, and there's people here who know better than mm -hmm. I do from direct experience, but the, the surge uh, that is coming into North America is, uh, it includes clearly Haitians mm -hmm. and Venezuelans and Colombians, mm -hmm. but also Pakistanis mm -hmm. and Syrians mm -hmm. uh, who are also finding that there aren't many uh, sort of open doors anymore. Mm -hmm. And this is one, and as a result, we're not responding to that crisis. Yeah. I mean, we're still playing by you know, some, an old paradigm, to use the that word. You launched a task force at, at the World Refugee yeah. Council that kind of assessed the situation. Can you talk about that? What, what exactly yes. you found and how it's going to help perhaps solve some of these problems? Well, you know, I mean, part of the, the mandate we have at the council is to try to try to find solutions. I mean, we're, it's, it's, it's really sort of not just an advocacy, it's an idea. It's a, mm -hmm. We're trying to be entrepreneurial <laughs> when it comes to actually, because we have a lot of practitioners, mm -hmm. former ministers, uh, deputies, p people who've worked in refugee work. Uh, we have been involved in a network of, uh, Jeff, what would you say, two to 300 people from the Americas? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a very yeah. large yeah. network representing all kinds of different sectors. Came together first to discuss, then we did some serious research back in the region. We pulled that together. There was a wonderful woman named Elizabeth Ferris from Georgetown University, who's head of our research, who put this together. And then we've been doing, we've been in Guatemala, we've been in Mexico City, we've been in Ottawa, and we're setting up a meeting in Washington to start saying, here's what we found. And the one thing that came back, well, I, and there's not just one thing, a lot of things, but if I could have 60 seconds more, one was, 
there is no regional coordination or collaboration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're back into the old bilateral, unilateral, we'll fix our problems and don't bother me with having to sort of go to another, quote, international meeting. Mm -hmm. there, it really is, I mean, there's lots, the OAS is there and there's, there's meetings in Los Angeles. Uh, but I'm, I, you know, because I've become a, become a cranky old guy uh, <laughs> after all those years, I'm tired of declarations and rhetoric and mm -hmm. commitments and goals. It's like, you know, make it work. Mm -hmm. And that's not what's happening. There, there is that coming together. We, we, one of the proposals we made is, uh, is something that I think as Canadians, we, we don't pay enough attention to what we should because it's a model for how to do a regional collaboration on a serious issue. And that's the Arctic Council, mm -hmm. where we were able to actually bring indigenous people at the same table as the ministers. It was, and it's, it's a, it's a co-directed, cohabitation kind of governance system. And they were the, one of the very first organization. And by the way, so- are, how, how close are we though to something like that on this issue? Well, I guess, at the time, I was gonna say, we even had the Russians and the Americans mm -hmm. agreeing to Different it. times. A different time. Yeah. But it doesn't mean to say it can happen again. Yeah. But you have to put the, the, the politics of international uh, sort of mm -hmm. system that we're into right now. And I happen to think, I mean, I know it sounds, you know, maybe overly optimistic, but I think uh, as we're shifting this new world order around and everybody's putting their elbows up and poking them at each other, I think there's a lot of space and room for networks, like I just talked about, sure. to get a hold of these issues, yeah. like the, the whole issue of migration. I'd like to bring the two of you back into the conversation about specifically this, this issue. How much does it feel that this, this work that you're doing in scope is a necessary workaround mm -hmm. because governments aren't acting, aren't doing, aren't cooperating to do what needs to be done? I'll let Emmerich yeah. respond first because he's based in Clement. We've done a lot of work with local governments there to try to have them more engaged and support them in designing better policies and programs that respond to the crisis. Well, I, I think like it's, it's an excellent question and also the lack of regional coordination mechanisms mm -hmm. is, is something that needs to be addressed. Um, I think like in, in many, many cases, it's, it's, not, uh, it's, not, it's not really a question of, of whether um, there is a responsibility from the local government, yes. So basically, I think like a lot of the answers also come from the lack of legal protection status mm -hmm. that migrants are facing in many countries, the lack of willingness, let's say, of host countries to actually make proactively the efforts of addressing these issues. I think like obviously governments could do more. In the case of Colombia, and I will speak for what I know, because I'm based there for the last nine years, I think like a lot of European countries, maybe other countries could learn a lot from what Colombia has done in the last mm. two or three years with the general uh, legalization of mm -hmm. over 1.5 million um, migrants with no conditions for 10 years. Mm -hmm. I think like there are, there are so many ways local governments can do a lot. Obviously the shift we've seen in Colombia recently um, in the government makes it less of a priority. And there is also a need, I think, like to address it regionally. What we've okay. seen in Colombia is affecting Ecuador, it's affecting yeah. Peru, it's affecting Mexico. What is happening in Central America is affecting North America. So definitely like there is a lack of regional coordination and governments could do more. But also what we've seen in certain countries in Latin America, especially Colombia that did not have any trajectory okay. of receiving migrants is impressive. And I okay. think like, the fact that Global Affairs Canada, for instance, want to replicate these experiences from Colombia to countries such as Ecuador and Peru is also speaking a lot about mm -hmm. what's, what Canada or what other countries, so-called developed countries, can also bring to the process. And, and I think like that's, that's really a success story that we had mm -hmm. in Colombia. Mm -hmm. It's only 10,000, yeah. it was pointed out by, <laughs> by Tanya. It is 10,000, but at the same time, it's, it's leading the way to showing the integration mm -hmm. um, sort of relies in the mm -hmm. hand of everybody, of the private mm -hmm. sector, of uh, mm -hmm. individuals, of migrants themselves, sure. um, but also from local governments to address it properly. Mm -hmm. Sure. Tanya, I'll, I'll come mm -hmm. back to you in a minute. Just because you're talking sure. about Colombia, I, I would like to go to Alec again and just, just get a sense from you, Alec. How, how close do you think what you're living now is what you hoped for when you walked away from Venezuela? Mm. Actually, yes. Well, actually, what I'm living right now is what I actually 
uh, live in Venezuela. Right now, I'm more close to what I wanted to be when I leave my family behind. At least right now, I feel like I given them a better style of life, which is making me feel comfortable with what I'm doing. Because the fact that I have to leave them behind, it really, uh, it really make me sad. Because here you could have all the opportunities, here you could have all the benefit, but you don't have the, the family love, you don't wake up every other morning and you don't have your mom right next to you. That that makes you feel like you don't have everything that you ask for. But at least at least I'm glad that what I'm doing right now will help them to have a better style of life. Thank you for sharing that, Alec. Maybe one other thing before I go back to Tanya is, is what is it, when you hear these kinds of discussions about what is or isn't being done, you, you must, I can imagine things going through your mind of wanting to just, you know, shake the world and say, hey, pay attention. What, what is it that you would say to politicians, um, to governments in this region? To care, about more, uh, care more about your people because sometimes we just focus on the political part and we just forget about everyone because remember that everyone has life. Mm -hmm. People need to work in order to feed their family. So let's just work and let's just have a little more of faith in, in God as a primary option because God will be the first person. If we're good with God, everything will fit into better. So I will definitely say if, uh, if I have the, the opportunity to speak to uh, something or somebody that's political in my country, I will say to care a little more mm -hmm. yeah. about the people from there. Yeah. Tanya, you heard Lloyd say that Canada needs to do, to do more. What, what would that look like? I mean, we've been having discussions within CUSO um, about what that would look like. I think that there's some perceptions that when you provide support for a certain amount of time, that's enough, things are okay. But what we're seeing in Columbia, for example, is I think we've probably just touched the, type, the top of the iceberg. 10,000 people, that's great. You know, certain percentages are migrants, but there's many more people that could benefit. There's still going to be other people arriving. What we're seeing with the replication of scope in Ecuador and Peru is they're in a very different position than Colombia. Um, so in those countries, we are providing support and helping migrants navigate the legalization process. People are arriving, they don't have their papers, they don't know how to navigate, how do we become legal, how can we access a job? But it's not only just working with the migrants, but also working with the private sector or the government to understand that these are individuals that have skills, they're educated, they wanna work, they can contribute to society. And I think that's what we came up to in Colombia was working with companies saying, look, we've got a really qualified labor force that can meet the demands. And I think we've proven that in Colombia through the migrant population. Alec as well is one of our star participants, but we want to do that in, in Peru and Ecuador saying, look, we've only just started. There's still another three, five, ten years of work. And something that we've, you know, in discussions with Goal First Canada and other supporters and donors is that it shouldn't just stop now. We really need to look at long-term solutions. We know that many of the migrants will not return to their countries of origin. They're going to stay in Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, Chile. So how can we help to integrate them? And it's not just beneficial for the migrant population. Yes, we're providing jobs and you know social security, but at the same time, they're contributing to the economy. They're building the society. They're contributing members. So it's also sort of changing that mentality. We do a lot of work with confronting xenophobia. I'm sure Alec himself has probably um, experienced some of that. So that's part of our work as well, is how do we sort of promote that community integration. We do a lot of great work in Colombia. We were on a visit um, in November with Nicholas and Emmerich, and we attended a community integration session where it was Venezuelan migrants and members of the host community, Colombians, and they use cooking as a way as that mm -hmm. common ground mm -hmm. for the two countries. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're the same when it comes about cooking and ingredients, and that was a way of promoting community integration. So I think that's a big part of it as well, and that's long term. Yeah for host communities accepting migrants into their communities. I would like to actually talk about the, the fact that this crisis does draw so much hate, anger, mm -hmm. xenophobia, all those things. But before we get there, Lloyd, just back to you, mm -hmm. back to the, the question of what Canada can do more. Can you, can you say more explicitly? I mean, there's Canada, the government, and then there's 
and Canadians. Maybe can you address those two parts? Or is there anything more? They're supposed to be the same, but uh, some, <laughs> sometimes it doesn't work that way. Uh, let me use a, a case example, the, the last federal budget. Uh, after Mr. Biden, uh, President Biden's visit, we talked about investing in a new green economy, new technology, new solar systems, you know, getting all the new, but it was in North America. We're talking North American fortress for God's sake. I mean, that's something out of the 19th century or it's something out of the Canadian Business Council. I don't know where it is, but it's, it has nothing to do with going to scale. You have to be able to say, look it, we're gonna invest in these things, but it also means we're investing where, as Tanya had, uh, has pointed out, there's skilled workers. Yeah. There's a capacity to really develop. Uh, Honduras has more sunshine than Ontario does. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of stuff, but, but there's nobody thinking that way. Mm -hmm. They're saying, hey, let's open this up. This is a hemispheric issue. And all of a sudden you're providing employment opportunities mm -hmm. and judgments, and you're putting capital to work. And that capital, I mean, rather than giving a tax credit, to a, a foreign company to come to Canada, why don't we start giving a direct tax credit for companies in the hemisphere mm -hmm. to start developing the, the technology and, and the new chips and all the things that are, are needed. That to me becomes an international mm -hmm. industrial policy, yeah. not a North American or just a Canadian American policy. Mm -hmm. And that's, no, that's not a big leap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not a big leap. Yeah. But it's just because I think that there is a sort of, uh, all of a sudden we've shrunk our horizon. We're not thinking in those terms anymore. And I think that's, again, driven by the political system, which you know, has everybody kind of uh, tooth and nail. Mm. Uh, there isn't any kind of agreement on these things. That's why, by the way, a conversation like this is awfully important, mm -hmm. is to start putting these kinds of things uh, forward. But that to me, I, I mean, I go back, I, can I just have one more rant? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I, I watch with, uh, you know, I'm from Winnipeg, and so we get our news a day late usually, but uh, <laughs> uh, except for the Globe and Mail. But, uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> but I, wa I watch with interest about the great fuss that's being made that, oh, we're going back to the moon, and we have an astronaut. And it's only going to cost us half a billion dollars. Hey, come on, folks half a billion dollars being invested in Central America or Venezuela and developing the kind of technology and the, the workforce and training yeah. that you and QSU are doing. Boy, I mean, what a jolt. Uh, you know, what a booster shot that would be. Yeah. But it's not there. And that's what I, I, that's what I find is really, there's a, we've really kind of uh, shrunk our, our horizons and uh, shrunk our ambitions as a country. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just think Kansas is an awful lot better uh, than what we're doing now. Thank you. I, I do want to address the mm -hmm. what you raised, Tanya, the issue of, of xenophobia and how that manifests mm -hmm. itself both to the individuals mm -hmm. but also to you as development organization. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how it affects your work? How does it change what you do on the ground or how you're received on the ground? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, and I, I would also invite Emmerich to compliment um, what I say. I think in, I mean, I think in countries like Peru and Ecuador, because the Venezuelan migrants is recently arriving, we see much higher levels of xenophobia. I think in Peru, especially if anybody, um, we have Patricia Coots, our ex-chair of the board, who is Peruvian. I think in countries like Peru, we've seen really high levels of xenophobia. So a lot of the work that we do with our local partners, a lot of campaigns, obviously work really to try to work with host communities to understand that they're not coming in to replace jobs. A lot of the times, the jobs that migrants are occupying are jobs that local people don't want to do. And we say that in Canada with seasonal foreign workers. We have a very strong seasonal foreign workers program where we attract migrants from the Caribbean and Latin America, Central America, who come to fill jobs that Canadians um, either don't want or just are not being filled. So I think in countries like Peru, that's been a big challenge for us. But at the same time, we have partners who have been working in this area for many years that through those alliances, it helps us sort of keep moving forward. 
Um, in countries like Ecuador, also it's a smaller country, small scale. I think there's been more, maybe not so much xenophobia, but a lot of, re not resistance, but hesitation from the private sector. Mm -hmm. We've done a lot yeah. of work in Colombia over the last four years to really work with the private sector. One, to understand this is a viable workforce. So there's a lot of prejudice, misconceptions about, well, they're not educated, they don't have the skills, but also helping the private sector navigate the legalization process of hiring migrants. Mm. So in Peru, in Ecuador, what we've seen is that there's really a little bit of hesitation, resistance. And is it explicitly new. because of, I mean, did they say? I think yeah. they don't understand, yeah. right? And I yeah. think in Colombia and, and American compliment is that we just had com companies saying, well, well like, it's, it's difficult. We can't, we don't understand the legislation. We don't understand what we need to do. So part of what we do is like provide training to migrants to access jobs, but we provide training to companies to understand that process. Yes, it might be cumbersome, it might be difficult, but we're gonna break it down for you and we're gonna help you understand. Yeah. So it's working from both sides in terms of working with the government and maybe addressing, not hesitation, but we provided technical support in Colombia to help them better understand these are the needs. A lot of the work that we do is understanding what are the social, economic, and cultural barriers that migrants face to enter mm -hmm. um, the formal labor market. And so working with local governments, these are the barriers. This is how your policy can address those barriers. So I think yeah. that's how we've also addressed, maybe not xenophobia directly, yeah. but there's hesitation from all, all fronts. So I think we have sort of a three-prong approach working across all civil society, private sector, and government to address uh, like, that. Sorry. Ali, uh, like, could I ask you to speak to how accepted you feel? It's, it's one thing to, to have the work and to work at this company, but how accepted do you feel as uh, someone from Venezuela in Colombia? Sure. Well, actually, just to add something else, to add up something else to the topic, xenophobia, it does not only manifest as a violence, but it's also uh, discrimination, yeah. barriers of accessing to education, mm -hmm. healthcare, housing, and for me, from my point of view, that should be considered a crime to people that is no from the particular country. Here in Colombia, I have the luck that everywhere I go, uh, at least I've been accepted, especially for this company that I'm working right now. And all of that is due to the alliance, the partnership that has been doing between CUSO and my company. Uh, one aspect that we could highlight at Kuso right now is they are training my company and a lot of companies to actually, um, you can say like to, um, what's it called? To strengthen their strategies of inclusion yeah. mm -hmm. for migrant talent. Mm -hmm. But as of now, from my point of view, I could say that uh, um, I feel comfortable here because I haven't had the situation, but I know people that have had the situation and they feel very awful. Mm -hmm. They feel very awful about the xenophobia. Yeah. Thank you, Alec. I, I do want to remind the audience that you'll have a chance to ask everyone here a question as well. It won't all just be me. <laughs> um, in about maybe 10 minutes time mm -hmm. or something like that, just put up your hand and we'll, we'll come around uh, with questions. But I kind of want to bring it right back to the beginning and to the, to the SCOPE program mm -hmm. and to the fact that, you know, it is, I know it's a big toolbox and yeah. there are different ways of dealing with these crises. This is one that depends on the private sector. Mm -hmm. How crucial is that, do you think, looking forward mm -hmm. as a solution, given all these blocked doors everywhere else? And I'd like to hear all of you on this question. And Tanya, maybe we'll start sure. with you and then we'll go to the yeah. gentleman. I mean, I had the privilege of starting uh, with the SCOPE project in 2015 uh, while we were recruiting the team. And I can say for the first two or three years, when we tried to engage with the private sector, the door was shut on us every time. And I think part of the challenge just for us was understanding what is the role of the private sector, but also understanding what are their objectives. And what we had to learn was with the private sector and these, we're working with some really big companies, is this triple bottom line. It's about profits. So we had to sort of change our strategy in the sense of, look, if you participate in this gender equality training or inclusion training, we can guarantee you by creating safe workspaces, your employees are gonna stay longer, that's increased retention rates, you're gonna make more money. So I think in the beginning, there was a lot of learnings for us. I think also it was really um, sharing what are the key barriers of different populations that you're working with and if you can help provide solutions. So one thing, you know, we work with a lot of women migrants, single-headed families, childcare is a big issue. So mm -hmm. something we've done 
is either looking, you know, if we have 50 vacancies in a company and half of them are women, but there's childcare issues, okay, link them to childcare providers. We even have some companies who are starting their old childcare daycares. So that's really becoming a big issue. So I say with the private sector, what we try to do is educate them. These are the barriers. These are the solutions. You can address these barriers. You're going to have happy employees. They're going to stay forever, and you're going to make more money. So that has been a learning for me. Maybe Emmerich wants to compliment. I'll just back up completely what has been said. I think <laughs> a lot of um, the solution, I think, like to social economic integration of migrants within society actually relies on how we change the lens on this crisis. And I'll back up what Lloyd was saying in terms of how we can take advantage of this crisis. There are so many studies in the world that actually shows that migrants workforce, whether it's skilled, highly skilled, medium skilled, or really low entry jobs, is always contributing positively ultimately to the growth of the country. So, so I think like in terms of how we, um, we can <laughs> we can make it an opportunity. There is so many ways. Private sector is part of the option. And, and part of what we are looking, I think, not only in the migration crisis specifically, but in the international development community lately, is how we can shift from a philanthropic view mm -hmm. to an investment view. Like investing in migrants is mm -hmm. investing in your country. It's investing in the economy. And what Tanya was saying about the private sector is something that we've been seeing so clearly in Colombia 10 years ago when you were knocking at the doors um, of private sector companies saying, okay, you need to do inclusion of migrants, LGBTIQ communities, and uh, single uh, mothers, they would laugh at your face, you know, like because it wasn't something that, that was seen as something profitable. Also, in terms of how you speak with the companies, I think like in, in many ways, uh, presenting migrants as, as a special population is sort of taking, yeah. like it's putting another weight on their shoulders, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I think like Canada has so, so many good experiences in terms of how migrant workers can bring to the economy. And I was recently in Brussels um, in a conference led by Canada and by the EU, yeah. um, calling again for action in terms of how we can lay on the crisis. So I'm completely neutral, I'm not Canadian, I'm not a politician. <laughs> But what I can say is that also in showing ways, in, in showing how private sectors, how economic models, how societies and societal models can, can be exported somewhere else and, and be successful <coughs> in Colombia in my case, but somewhere else, mm -hmm. it's also taking advantage of this crisis, both for Canada, but also for host countries. Lloyd, you, you know, you're engaged daily on this conversation in this country. I wonder how much you think self-interest is now a crucial way to sell the idea of helping out? Is it become more so than the past? No, I, I think what is being seen as self-interest is being interpreted as national interest. Hmm. Uh, and that means uh, in reinvesting in what are your existing institutional structures, strengthening them, but the kind of money we pour in isn't designed to do exactly this, which is to mm -hmm. help uh, in the financing. Uh, look, the budget for international development was just cut in the last budget. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's not the last, you know, it, I mean, uh, there was a time I was in, involved uh, gratefully with CUSO, mm -hmm. and uh, your budget cut after budget cut. What was being cut was what I, what, what I called was making money uh, investments enabling so organizations like CUSO, or even ours, because we've been working in Columbia on housing, to say, how do we get some talent, some skills, some knowledge together? How do we go to the, the International Development Bank and the, and the World Bank and the other financial institutions and go to town and say, here's what you have to invest in. But you don't get money from GAC anymore to do that. Mm -hmm. it, it's, yeah. it's, uh, a lot of the money goes to large sort of international organizations and, I, and I, I don't sort of question them, but we're not investing in our ability as Canadians to be sort of mentors. I, I mean, we've even talked, you know, the, the Minister of Immigration talked about new pathways. Okay, here's a new pathway. Let's start bringing young men and women from, from the Americas to our universities and our technical colleges to learn some serious if, issue in finance, to start learning about AI, to start becoming involved. Is anything it, like that happening now? No. Uh. I mean, uh, we have, 
a lot of international students, but that program is designed as a way of subsidizing the university system because governments don't want to pay enough for that. And I was a university president, and I can tell you, you know, without international development students being charged three times what a Canadian student is, you, half the universities in this country would collapse. And that's what it's all about. It isn't about saying, let's, let's find some, you know, I, I, want, I want to tell one story. No. You know, uh, there, there's a woman who works on our council, uh, Maya Vistella, former foreign minister from El Salvador. And when she was speaking in Guatemala in one of our discussions, she talked about what was happening to young women uh, on the convoys, on the trains. Hmm. They were being basically being used as the, uh, as, the, as the password for these thugs who stop them and say, you want to take the next section of the ring? Give me your daughter. Hmm. I mean, it was a pure sexual exploitation, and we let it happen. Now, I want to say, Jane, where are you? Jane Fleming has an interesting program that she's running right now, bringing sexually violated women from the camps in Greece and, and Jordan. We're working with the Canadian government to say, do the same thing. There's another pathway. <laughs> we could open up 15 different pathways for people who are finding a, a recourse. Skills, health, education, mm -hmm. finance, business, environment, you name it. Mm -hmm. And what we need, though, is some people on the ground. Because the other discrimination we have in other parts of the world, we have major immigration offices that basically process people and, and, and implement the programs. In the Americas, it's all, uh, let, let somebody else do it. Yeah. I gotta tell you, I mean, I don't know what's going on. And somehow there's a kind of a, uh, I, I have to, I'm moving to Ottawa, so I'm gonna test the drinking water uh, <laughs> to see if there's, if there's something that sort of affects you know, the frontal uh, brain lobes or not. You know? <laughs> let us know, please, what you, <laughs> what you, what you discovered. Um, to, to sort of end off, I, I wondered if we could go back to the SCOPE program mm -hmm. and just and go back to the numbers. Sure. How scalable is this? I mean, is this just a, a small tool in the box? Or is it, can we imagine instead mm -hmm. of 10,000, maybe 100,000 next year? <coughs> Okay. Is that doable? Well, 100,000, I'm not sure. It depends. I'll, I'll speak and then let Emmerich speak. I mean, I think replicating it in Peru and in Ecuador, I mean, we have in Colombia 10,000 people over eight years. It seems like a lot of people, but we also think that's just a drop in the bucket. It's not that many people, especially to get there over eight years. Although the first two or three years, it was kind of trial and error. In Peru and Ecuador, it's, it's a pilot, so our numbers are much more conservative. You know, in two years, we're looking at linking, you know, 1,200 people to jobs. I think it is scalable, but there needs to be the buy-in from the private sector in Peru and in Ecuador. It's, they're much smaller than Colombia. I mean, we work with 100 companies in Colombia, but we have, you know, companies that have vacancies of two, 300, 400 people at a time. Mm -hmm. So that's bigger numbers. In, in Ecuador, we have companies that are maybe looking for 10 or 20 people at a time. I think it depends on the context. I think a lot of it depends on the financial resources, the buy-in from the private sector, from the government, the civil society. So yes, I think they are scalable, but there's long-term investment that's required. It doesn't happen overnight. In the case of Ecuador, there are some organizations that are piloting, linking migrants to jobs, but they're talking about 30 people linked in a year. We're talking about 1,000 people linked in two years. So the scalability, I think there's challenging depending on the context and where they are in the, the migrant crisis. For sure. Oh, I'm yeah. reckoning the news. Is that okay? Well, sure. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, just because yeah. you were yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I really think it depends on how you count. Yeah. And that's the problem with international development. You count participants, you count, you count people, you know, and mm -hmm. you need like a proof that <coughs> you've contributed to this and that. I think like if you look at figures then, like what we can say is that we've impacted half a million employees. And I think that's a figure that speaks way more for itself because we are able to count for 10,000, that we have the proof that these 10,000 actually had the job contract. Mm -hmm. But if you look at what we've been doing with more than 100 private sector companies in Colombia, actually these companies are employing more than half a million employees. Mm -hmm. All of these companies receive training in um, diversity and inclusion, not only how to um, integrate migrants in their workforce, but also integrate a single mother, 
internally displaced uh, people, victims of the armed conflict, all sorts of people that are excluded, vulnerable, mm -hmm. um, excluded from the labor market. So mm -hmm. I think like what we are looking at through international development, it's beyond the numbers, it's the impact, the okay. systemic impact that you are generating. And projects such as Scope that are working with the private sector, generating social investment into, into the country, it's hard to measure. You cannot measure mm -hmm. like in the very short term why it's going to impact. Okay. But working with a multi, like big multi, multinational company in the continent can impact millions of lives. So, and I think this is what we do. So 10,000 is, is, is really nothing compared to, to what we do at the systemic level. Sorry, Lloyd, go ahead. Well, I just I was going to comment about scale. If you want to go to scale, you need a lot of money. Mm -hmm. That's why you need government and or the private sector. And you have to be able to say to them, this is not a pilot project here, and here's a, here's a chance to do something interesting and write us a report. You have to be able to say, there's serious mm -hmm. money. Yeah. And that's not happening now. And one reason is because, uh, and I can say this as a former parliamentarian, mm -hmm. we have so totally sort of uh, complicated and engrossed ourselves into all kinds of assessments, auditing, accountabilities, uh, financial. You talk, well, there's a number of NGOs in this audience. They can tell you what's being required now. And, I, and because what you're afraid of, you know, uh, some, some person across the aisle is going to come and say, well, can you not prove that XYZ company in Ecuador hasn't used the money, you know, to pay their grandmother or whatever the case. And, and so there's this, there's a, a, a one of the things I, I try to learn when I was in cabinet is to say, if you really want to be liberal and do it, you also have to have, know how to implement it. And it's not enough to make the speeches or put the program, you have to design how it's going to work. And that means it has to meet parliamentary standards and audit. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. And, and somehow we've lost that capacity. Mm -hmm. Our public service is not doing that. Yeah. I mean, you saw all the money about consultants. Come on, you know. Uh, uh, I'm glad that we have consultants somewhere. <laughs> um, but uh, that's not the point mm -hmm. of being accountable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's got to be. It's got to be a public system. So there. So, so <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet. <laughs> not at all. Two, two more uh, things mm -hmm. before we go to the audience. Back to you, Tanya. Um, as we started talking about 7 million people, mm -hmm. um, far more when you look at everything else that's happening in mm. this part of the world. It is not on the lips of every Canadian. How do you change that? I mean, I mean well, events like this, of course, I think there has to be some conversation. I think it's very easy for some people to say, not in my backyard, you know, it doesn't happen here. I think the one thing I appreciate about Canada is I think Emmerich was right in saying in Lloyd that we have very good examples of the, you know, the socioeconomic integration of migrant populations. Um, I think part of it is through the work that Kisu International does, that, you know, always when we have volunteers or staff members that are working on the ground, just the impact of hearing the stories like Alec you don't really know the impact that a Canadian can have until you actually meet someone like Alec or you visit a country or you visit a project. So I think a lot of it is just, and I think some people, they, they are unsure of what their role is. You know, well, I can't go and travel abroad. Well, there's other ways to get engaged. And I think it's just people aren't aware of what's going on around the world. And I also feel that there's many different That's important similar. events happening. And... Yeah. You know, there's the migrant crisis, there's the war in Ukraine, there's earthquakes, there's natural disasters. Things kind of get lost sometimes in the news. So it's about having conversations and, you know, educating everything from children to adults to, you know, different communities. I think for me, that's what Ms. Canadians don't understand sometimes the role they can play. A short contrarian opinion, and then we're going to go to Yeah, you know, Look, I very rarely compliment the Globe and Mail, but <laughs> they had an essay on New Year's Day, written by Michael Adams from Unverionix, said the Canadians, um, way ahead of anybody else, are committed to diversity, to migration, to immigration, and to refugees. And one of the reasons for that is the thing called our Charter of Rights. I mean, that changed. So we no longer think that hockey and, and antelopes jumping over 
Rocky Mountains or make Canada. It's the fact that we're a diverse population and we yeah. like it. We, we like doing it. But what we're not doing is then tapping in yeah. to that energy and the position. Yeah. I mean, the sponsorship program we had originally brought tens of thousands of Canadians working uh, with new refugees coming in. Mm -hmm. It's too complicated now. It's too expensive. There's too much paperwork. So we don't even use the sponsorship program. We've stopped doing it. I'm saying, wait a minute. It had a huge impact on not only helping people to come, but changing Canadian attitudes because they realized that a, a refugee was not illegal, not a criminal, mm -hmm. not a druggie. They, were, they wanted a better place for the kids. And boy, that to me, and it goes back a little bit, you know, to, uh, to why I thought QC is important because they talk about mm -hmm. that volunteerism of Canadians. I think it's there, latently it's there, but we're just not giving any outlet for it. Mm -hmm. Alec, for me anyway, you get, you get the last word. <laughs> I'm just, I'm wondering where you imagine yourself five years, ten years down the road. I don't mean physically where, but where do you imagine your life being at, at that stage? Good question. Um, definitely around my family. Hmm. Definitely close to my family regardless of the outcome, regardless if I'm, well, of course, everyone wants to be successful in life, but regardless if I achieve my goals, I want to be around my family. Of course, right now, I feel grateful because I'm achieving my goals, but in the future, definitely, I, if I'm successful, if I get to the top of my company, I want to be sharing my experience right next to my relative. Mm. I want to have a family and I want my, my little kid, to, you know, to grow up right next to my family. I want to go back home and tell my story, tell everyone the experience, tell everyone all the things that I have to go through in order to be where I wanted it to be at the time. Great. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alec. Thank you to all of you for taking my questions. Mm -hmm. I've hogged you for all this time. Maybe we'll open it up to everyone else in case you have questions for our panelists. So please, just put your hand up. That's the first one right there. Just maybe stand up so we can all hear you, and then... And your name? I'm Daniel, I'm Colombian myself. Oh. I'm an international student here studying nice. immigration mm -hmm. and human rights and international relations at mm -hmm. the University of Toronto. Great. And I wanted to thank you for everything you've mm -hmm. done for Colombia, for Venezuelans, for our mm -hmm. hemisphere. Uh, there obviously is a huge gap or even a divide between Canada mm -hmm. and Latin America. I think you've built a very important bridge, and so I wanted to acknowledge mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. and really thank you from bottom of my heart and from my people as well. Uh, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Now I, I wanted I know there are many layers of complexity in Latin America. We haven't talked about IDPs, for example. Mm -hmm. right? um, and I know there's also future challenges like climate refugees, yeah. climate IDPs. Mm -hmm. um, my question is how do we ensure that we are planning in advance and that we're responding rather than reacting? Mm -hmm. Are we ready for what's next and what is Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Would you like to take that oh, on? Well, that, I think that's the trickiest question. <laughs> okay. He's going to come up from well, the audience. Sure, yeah. Um, uh, but no, go, sure. He's, yeah. I think, do, would you like to take I'm, it I'm, I'm absolutely happy to do it. Like, I, I think like there, I there is, in, in my way, there is no, no, no good way of saying we can be prepared for the worst. Like, we are always sort of thinking about what is going to happen, about mm -hmm. the climate crisis and so on. I think a big part of the answer is having mechanisms in place and also about changing the focus. Mm -hmm. Acknowledging, as you were saying, what is happening is, is a big part of the issue. As I was saying, I was, I was in Brussels not long ago and I was listening to a lot of head of governments, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and a lot of people speaking about what needs to be done uh, to address this specific crisis um, that we are seeing in Latin America, uh, specifically the Venezuelan crisis. And I think no one has the answer. I think part of the answer is coordinated answers, um, meaning that the burden and, and let's say that the, the, um, the answers should be co more coordinated. I think that's one of the reasons. And the second is empowering communities. I think like as long as you rely on 
uh, individual themselves and give com communities, individual, the tools to go forward, it's the best way to be prepared. So whatever we do in Crusoe is always through the community lens. Whatever we do with government, private sector actors and so on is essential for it to work and to be prepared to provide better answers. But I think ultimately when you empower communities, you are providing people with the solution to, um, um, to their own problems. So that would be my answer. Okay. Thank you. I think, Lord, you had a short comment on that? Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, again, I, I think politically. And about three years ago, David Suzuki and I got together to have a conversation about how do we get people who are concerned about refugees and displacement to work with people concerned about climate and to, and to combine their efforts around the issue of the impact it's going to have on the movement of people. You thought we were talking, you know, about getting uh, sort of uh, two Kentucky tribes together or something. <laughs> they just wouldn't do it. Mm. And that, if you don't have that, if you can't sort of, uh, I always used to say, uh, good politicians know how to count. <laughs> and the more heads you count, the more impact you're going to have. And that would have been a very powerful movement if it had been able to be put together, that would have really changed and made sure that the two issues were coexistent and integrated as opposed to each in their own silo. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? We have Kieran. Hello, my name is Kieran. Um, it's interesting actually that you're speaking about merging climate. Uh, people are concerned about the climate, people are concerned about migration. Yeah. I come from an environmental science background, so we were discussing a lot before about Canada on the world stage, um, how this is uh, an area where there's a lot of good faith involved, and the uh, kind of like what's going on internationally, geopolitically, and the potential of reshuffling. So how can initiatives, uh, because this is a lot of good faith, how can initiatives that deal with international matters such as this, build good faith, and help Canada's peacemaker image brand continue to promote that brand, which has been historically very popular uh, on the world stage as things get more reshuffled in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lloyd, would you like to take that? Well, to begin with, we don't do peacekeeping anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. Coming out of the war in Afghanistan, and uh, General, what was his name, Rick Hillier, uh, our military wants to kill. They don't want to keep the peace. We've really changed our military uh, strategy. We don't do peacekeeping. I mean, I think last count, last count we have about seven people in peacekeeping missions around the world. I mean, that's, a, that's part of the mythology. But it doesn't mean to say that there's not an awful lot of things we can do and, and in some cases are doing to ensure the security of individual people. I mean, I think Canada has been a major mover at the United Nations and ensuring that UN peacekeeping actually would protect civilians, not just UN peacekeepers. There's been a real effort to come to grips with the issue of women and, and girls uh, in these circumstances and to put some serious effort to providing how do they establish their legal rights. But it's not coherent. Uh, I mean, there's no, there's no kind of unifying uh, th thematic to it. And I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not here to... Uh, I mean, what I try to do as a foreign minister is to talk about human security, protection of civilians as opposed to protection of nation states. And that enabled us mm -hmm. to do a lot of things around the notion of being able to provide uh, the, the security. And that goes back to, now to your question, what, what, what's it for Canada? Well, I think we, our security does depend on a world that isn't ridden with conflict or massive climate impacts. And the more that we can enlist and, and be partners with a much larger coalition than we are. I mean, that's why I got so ticked off at the Fortress North America a message that was coming out. We have to really broaden our reach. We, have to, we, we, we do have a capacity to be global in our thoughts. There's lots of Canadians <coughs> who are that way. It's just that somehow it's got to get translated into the canal way. Great. Thank you. Madame de Rosier.
largely the university sector. Uh, so what my question was, could we imagine scope being done by Columbia NGOs? Mm -hmm. And what can uh, Canadian universities or, uh, or universities in Columbia do to uh, foster the idea that it, it could be a uh, brought in and, and develop from inside. Can you become a train to train more sort mm -hmm. of thing as opposed to uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's a way of scaling it up actually is not owning the, yeah. the brand. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll let Emmerich respond. I mean, yeah. just we're looking at private sector engagement, public sector engagement. We have engaged with the academia in the past, providing psychosocial support to victims of the conflict and migrants. So maybe if you want to more on that. Yeah, I, I think like um, we were well, one also of many organizations mm -hmm. um, uh, doing this work. I think Colombia has a particularity, as some of you may know, it's part of the OECD. It's, it's a so-called uh, middle-income countries. Uh, but also highly unequal. So we have the chance, let's say, of having a highly organized civil society. Um, CUSA International is not working as an international organization, bringing its own vision, its mm -hmm. own um, truth. Um, I think like everything we do and a lot of international organization can relate to that, is working with the organized civil mm -hmm. society in Colombia. As I was saying, it's a highly developed country. The civil society is extremely strong mm -hmm. in Colombia. So they are our partners, they are not, our beneficiaries, so the, um, there is no such relations. And when we are working very strongly with so many different local NGOs, um, national also uh, NGOs, some of them bigger than we are ourselves mm -hmm. in Colombia. So, so I think there is a humility to that. Um, we can bring tools, methodology, way of thinking, but ultimately, if we want to scale up, that depends on local yeah. civil society, local universities, academia, and so on and so forth. So, so definitely there is, there is a need to work by hand with local communities, with local NGOs and, and other organizations, but also with public institutions. We receive funding also partly from national government institutions, ministers, the minister in charge of fighting poverty and so on. So also like we are in a place at the intersection of what countries like Canada, organizations, international organizations like ours, local organizations can do. And ultimately it doesn't rely in the hand of CUSO that mm -hmm. Colombia finds um, an end for the social economic integration of the crisis. So definitely we do, and this is the way to go, I, I think. Great, thank you for the question. Farah. Uh, so Farah Mohammed, I recognize I'm standing between a glass and wine for some of you, and I'm <laughs> breaking fast for others, so I'll make this quick. I came to this country when I was two from Uganda as a refugee in 1972, so thank you, Minister, for the work that you did. Um, I wonder if you might just give your reflections on the lack of action from Canada on Afghanistan. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I have a, a couple of reactions. I, I think that uh, uh, we went into that conflict not knowing why we went into it to begin with. It was done for reasons that uh, uh, Mr. Or Prime Minister Martin at the time thought that uh, this would win favor in Washington. Uh, we went to Kandahar, not even know how to spell it. Uh, and there was, I think, some serious efforts done by CETA and, and maybe some people in this room to actually meld not just the military security side of it, but to start doing sort of community work, community, uh, but, but it had no anchor. I mean, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't based uh, on, a, on a rooting of people within Afghanistan. I, I mean, the problem was, uh, once the war began, remember uh, when, after 9-11, uh, the whole invasion takeover uh, of Afghanistan uh, by the Taliban was based because uh, countries like ours, not mainly ours, but the Brits and the Americans and some of the Europeans, you know, insisted that the warlords stay in power in Afghanistan. They didn't give open or license to young Afghan men and women to take over and run the country. In fact, I remember meeting with a group of them in Peshawar who had escaped because they were being hunted down mm. by the warlord gang. In other words, we were playing the old, we were playing the old power game, and I think that I think that stuck with us. 
and I think the tragedy is that when it came to the investment, incredibly good investment, made in women's education and things of that kind, uh, there, there wasn't an infrastructure to make sure uh, it, it could continue. And I think when, when the war, we, we, our government pulled out very quickly, it had no transition plan. Uh, and we said, well, that's fun. We, and we left everybody alone. And I think that that to me uh, was tragic. And uh, frankly, as Canadians, we should be embarrassed uh, that we sort of left so many people who had relied so much and in which we had made commitments to, left them hanging uh, to the to the viciousness of the Taliban. And, I, and that's, again, I just thought that we had kind of lost our way. You, you know, can I just say one more thing? <laughs> I we need to I, get one more question in, so make it Okay, quick. I'll, make, I'll make it be <laughs> eight words. We have lost our understanding of human rights in this country. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll, hmm? Oh, sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm not even looking over there. So just, we have about five minutes left. So we'll, we'll start there, and then these two questions together, just so we can get as many in as possible. So please go oh, ahead. Really quick. Um, I'm just back from Mexico. I'm a filmmaker, mm. and I've been making a film about the migrants who are crossing Mexico from Central America and Latin America, mm. who are trying to get, it's called Where Can We Live in Peace? And nearly all of them just want to find a place where they can mm -hmm. bring up their children safely. The idea is to bring faces and voices of these mm -hmm. people who you will see are just like you or me. It's just mm -hmm. where we were born, and we were very lucky where we were mm -hmm. born. If anybody wants to show the film in their community, mm -hmm. in their university, my idea is to raise awareness so that we know more about what the whole situation mm -hmm. is about, and we meet the people involved. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Please go ahead. Um, so I'm a return uh, piece of volunteer, oh, and thank you very much for this. Um, my question is, is there any possibility of Kiso doing work in Venezuela itself mm. to assist people to make, prevent migration? Sure. I think we get that question a lot. I think there's also changing dynamics in Venezuela that there may be more appetite for Canadian or international organizations to engage. I think this is a conversation um, that we are having internally is to see is there a role. I think it's also being conscious that there's a lot of players in Venezuela already. Um, having a discussion with Emmerich, we know that there is going to be funding in Venezuela and there's a lot of people going to be returning. So looking at how do you support that socioeconomic integration. I think I can say on behalf of Kisa International, we are open to exploring. Um, but we don't currently have programming there, but I think it fits nicely in our work with the socioeconomic integration of not only migrants, but return. There's going to be a lot of returned individuals to Venezuela. So we are, we are very open to exploring opportunities. Good. Great. Thank you very Great. much. Last Thank question you. is over here. Thank you very much. My question to Mary. How serious are the protection threats Venezuela? And do people who are at the place of displacement or the place of origin know about these well, the, the, I mean, as, as any migration process, but migration process are really risky uh, first. So a lot of migrants, and, and maybe perhaps that's less true now, but like for many, many years, uh, it was walkers, meaning that they would walk thousands of kilometers to cross the frontiers, get to their places in Colombia. So that by itself is a journey that is extremely demanding, extremely risky in terms of what they are uh, facing. Um, that's one. I think there are other roads. We are speaking about Central America. Mm -hmm. Now in Panama, in the Darien, we also have now very dangerous routes from Colombia to mm -hmm. Panama. There is crossing the jungle. There is also generating risks for the life of the mm -hmm. migrants themselves. So the journey itself is extremely high. And then, as Tanya was mentioning, uh, vulnerable people in general like um, have protection needs that are high. When you speak about someone that doesn't know the country where um, um, he's heading at, uh, that there is no uh, knowledge of the education and legal system, that there is no legal status, that mm -hmm. uh, you don't even have um, paperwork um, to ask for a credit card or a loan and so on. That makes it not only immediate protection risks for your life, but also protection assistance that you need, meaning that your basic human rights are not supplied. So, so I think like, um, and, and there's so many migrants that we're working in in, in Colombia are telling us, uh, it's not. A, it's it's also about how you perceive these these risks. You know, like is, is it a risk that your uh, kids are not going to school? Well, uh, 
yes, it's, it's a risk because basically they're not going to have the opportunities they uh, deserve in life. So, so basically, like in terms of protection needs, they are very high. But I think like what is really needed is having access to basic social services, health, shelter, and so on. And that makes it a very difficult journey, not only the journey itself, but also the fact of settling somewhere. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Thank you for the questions. Uh, Nick gets the final word, oh. right? You're supposed to say goodbye? No. OK, well, then I will. <laughs> I just want to thank every one of you, Amarik, Tanya, Lloyd, and especially Alec, for com mm -hmm. coming to us all the way from Bogota. Thank you very much for all your insights. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thanks. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, guys. <laughs>